So today we get to talk about prayer. Prayer. So the question is, how often do you pray? If you're honest with yourselves, you don't have to answer out loud. I don't want to embarrass anybody or myself. How often do we pray? Is it just before we eat, you know, with family dinners? Is it just before bed? Do you ever fall asleep and forget to say your prayers? Is it as prayers are needed or throughout the day? How often do we pray? In today's message, we're given insight and when prayer should be for all Christians, according to St. Paul. So I, I have a short story for you here. So a young boy heard the news that his dad was going to make general in the military. Anybody ever meet a general before? Anybody? They're strong characters, you know. Um, I met the one at Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport, Louisiana. And all of us teenagers asked him point blank, is there nuclear bombs here on base? Because they had the B-52s. And he said, I can't confirm or deny, right? They're big characters, right? Powerful guys that can, with a flip of a switch, end life for so many. But this young boy, silent for a moment, asked his mom, do you think he will mind if I still call him daddy? Paul, in today's scripture, reminds us in his prayers that Christians have unrestricted access to God, the God of the universe. We don't need uh, a pastor. We don't need a bishop. We don't need anyone else to go before the Lord to give our prayers and petitions to God. In fact, Scripture tells us what? To pray without ceasing. Likewise, we can read God's Word on our own, and we should desire to because of our faith in Jesus. So some of you guys are friends with me online, but on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, in 1536, William Tyndale, do you guys know who this is? It's an early church martyr, was strangled and burned at the stake for translating scriptures into English for the common man. Burned at the stake for translating the Bible into the words of the people. And not shortly after, we have the King James Bible that was translated for all the people. The very guy that killed him then translated the Bible for English for the rest of the commoners. See, as in relationships with God, we can only grow if we talk to our Heavenly Father in prayer. We have to. We can't have a relationship if we don't talk to God. We can't have a relationship with the Lord if we're not in His Word. And again, it has to be more than Sunday morning, right? It has to be throughout our week. Get in His Word for yourselves. People have died for you to have the Bible. And let me tell you, friends, this may not always be the case. We may not always have the ability to read the Word of God legally, both in this country and around the world. People are dying for it. Again, while there's a lot of devotional material, anybody have a daily devotional you read? Anybody? Great. Some of you may have an app that sends you a reminder. Uh, I know somebody in the church has, it's, it's really cool, I want to find out the app of it. But every day at a certain time, it has like a singing chorus to tell them it's time to pray, right? Um, and while Lutherans, we have, man, I've never seen a denomination or a group of people fight over hymnals as much as Lutherans, right? <laughs> like we have so many, like, like I always tell people, I'm a green hymnal Lutheran because that's what I learned, right? Uh, but now we have the cranberry, that this was a new one for me. We have the red one. Uh, Dennis in the back gave me a black hymnal from like 1920. And so everyone has their hymnal of choice. And they all have prayers. And they all have written liturgy. And there's conversation on why things change. But nowhere in literature, nowhere 
else, excluding the Lord's Prayer, is there more meaningful and helpful prayers than those from the Apostle Paul? A man, again, who was converted to faith that murdered early Christians. So how, how would we trust somebody on death row right now to give us prayers, devotionals? How much time would we be willing to sit in a jail cell with him, him or her and hear what they have to say? Now, this isn't in my script. <laughs> uh, one of my seminary professors, Dr. Thomas Strong at the Southern Baptist Seminary in New Orleans, uh, the seminary there had a program at Angola Prison. Anybody hear of Angola? All right, we got one in the back. Colin heard of it. So Angola is death row in Louisiana. We used to live by it in St. Francisville, Louisiana. It's surrounded by swamp. So if the inmates happen to get out, it used to be a plantation. They get eaten alive, right? And if they're so lucky to be raised in the swamps like I was, they'll escape and then they'll hitchhike. But anyway, they had this program where the seminary would go in and train pastors within the inmates. And they would actually get an education for free, which upset us all at the seminary who were paying lots of money to go to school there. And I said, well, I guess we need to go to jail and then we'll get a free education. But anyway, one day he's in there with all these ex-murderers teaching a class and they lose power. And the power comes back on and they're surrounding him in a circle to protect him from the other inmates. Incredible. There's a lot of ministries that minister to inmates, like Cairo's ministry, for example. The Episcopal Church of uh, Florida uh, does the same program all throughout Jacksonville, etc. These men and women made mistakes. They committed sin. But they're still children of God, just like us. How would we hear Paul's words knowing what he did? The context. So in this prayer this morning, Paul prays for three things that believers should experience in prayer. The power of God, the presence of Christ, and the perception of his love. Which brings us to our first point here, the power of God. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit and your inner being. The power of God. Do you believe in the power of God this morning? The power of the Holy Spirit. That it's active and working in the world. Or is it just something we talk about? Do you believe that the God's power is infinite? That He can do all things? Let's go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. You will receive power. The power of God. See, friends, each of us have been given the gift of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are given this mighty act. Does anybody know how? How are we given the gift of the Holy Spirit? You hit it. Through water and the Spirit. The water and the Spirit. Through our baptisms, we are given the gift of the Spirit. A Scottish theologian named John Modiff translated this verse as this, a mighty increase of strength by His Spirit and the inner man. See, we have no power on our own. We just read in our Gospel this morning that we must be last. We must be the servant of all. But this is God's power. God has available all the power we need to live, work, and serve Him. Philippians 4.13 tells us, I can do all things through Him, who gives me strength. I can do all things. All things. When we think we're at the end of the road, we have no more energy to keep going. God's there. God is there. The power comes to our lives through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. When we meet temptation, 
which we all will, He can help us conquer it. When we have anger or sins in our life that weigh us down, He can help us overcome them. When we face difficult days, which we all will at some point, His power will see us through. Because we can do all things through Him who gives us strength. His power is limitless. For we serve an all-powerful God who listens and responds to our prayers. I mean, after all, what's the point of praying if nothing happens? Right? If you don't believe in prayer, you believe in a dead God. God's not dead. He's alive. We have a relationship with Him. We can go directly to the God of the universe. You know, as we look at this church, how often do we pray for it? That God will use this congregation, use this church built, right, on faith. Built on faith. So we can experience the presence of Christ. Verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. Second, Paul prays that we experience the presence of a living Christ. A living Christ. And God's Spirit within us, Christ is also there. Our faith is the entrance in which He enters our very being. And according to Martin Luther, you guys know who Martin Luther is, right? Good there? Everybody, raise your hand if you know, know who he is. Okay, good. Everybody's awake. Good. All right. According to Martin Luther, there's three a threefold power here. Through our faith in Christ, we are free from the law of sin and death. All right? So we all acknowledge our sin, but we are freed from it. We don't have to be weighed down in guilt and shame every day. Once we, once we go before the Lord and and repent. And we, you know what repentance is, right? It's when we, when we acknowledge our sin and we choose to do something about it. It doesn't mean I repent and then I just keep doing it, right? I try. I make an attempt. Now, am I going to fall sometimes? Yes. We have been freed from the law of sin and death. And through faith, we honor God. He's our heavenly Father. We came into this world through Him. Right? He knows every hair on our head. He gives us every day we wake up. Right? Every day on this side of the dirt is a good day. Right? Every day. I don't care how old we are or young we are. Every day could be our last day. We don't know. Through faith, our souls are united with Christ. United with Christ is established in our experiences and through our darkest hours, Luther said. And if you remember last week, uh, the gospel text was about it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? And I think honestly, this is why. Sometimes when you have uh, the ability to do things for yourself, those rock bottom moments don't come as easy. Uh, do they have rock bottom moments just because they're, you know, wealthy? Yes, absolutely. But sometimes they can rely on themselves a little bit longer. Probably some of the best ministry. Now, I heard this, I believe, from Eva Melosi here, that one of the pastors used to go to the bar room and minister. The first pastor ministered in the bar rooms to people. Now, why? Because some of those people are having some rock bottom moments. They need to hear Jesus loves them. It reminds me of my home pastor. He used to have a, a shirt that said bar chaplain on it. And he was in there at least, I don't know, twice a week. And he didn't drink. He was a Methodist minister, so he couldn't. <laughs> he, he might be. <laughs> but, you know, we need to be people in their lowest moments, their lowest parts of their life where Jesus is the way. Jesus frees them from that sin and death. 
Our faith, friends, in Jesus should grow stronger and stronger each day. And as we do, through His Holy Spirit and His Word, our relationship with Jesus, man, it, it changes our life. Christ's presence in our life is more than an overnight stay at a hotel where we can choose to check in and check out when we want to, right? I mean, you know, I mean, there's some really nice hotels. I might want to stay longer. I've been in some really bad ones too. Anybody stay at a Ritz Carlton before? Like we got one. My wife stayed at one uh, because she went to a teacher conference, and uh, they always complain they don't have no money, and then they put them up at the Ritz. You know, I don't know. But our relationship with Jesus is more than an overnight stay at the hotel. It's like buying a house and choosing to live there forever, right? Brother Lawrence, a Catholic monk, and I'd be interested, Maisie, if you guys have a book from him in the library. <laughs> Brother Lawrence, he's one of my favorite Christian authors. Um, when I went to seminary, we had to take a lot of classes on what we call spiritual formation because we want to walk away Christians, right? Not just educated theologians. And, and I try to convey that through my sermons. I really do. Because theology is great. It impacts how we do church. But to the loss and least of these out there in the community, they don't want to hear all that. They want to hear how Jesus meets them where they are. So he wrote a book called The Practice of the Presence of God. The Practice of the Presence of God. And as he scrubbed floors in the kitchen, cleaned the, cleaned the monastery, he believed that Jesus was there with him. Jesus was there with him. Recognizing the presence of our Lord with us daily will help us reject temptation and choose obedient service to our God. Daily. He's there with us, which helps us understand his love. Again, verse 17 and 18, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power and together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and deep, high and deep, is the love of Christ. Lastly, we are rooted and grounded in God's love. And let us remember love is costly. It's not what the world is telling us love is. The love of Jesus was Jesus dying on a cross and choosing to. Choosing to die on a cross. It was a choice. And I'm not trying to go off on a tangent. I'm trying not to. There was a bumper sticker that said, if Jesus had guns, he would still be alive. Something to that effect. Okay, so there's radicals on both sides. And here I am. I'm a gun owner and all this kind of stuff. You guys know that. But Jesus chose to die. He had a choice. He could have lived. I mean, he is the son of of the living God, right? He is God in the flesh. It's a very complicated relationship there. But the point here is God chose to die for the sins of the world. Love is costly. And what is our love for our fellow man? It's one that's costly. It's one where we tell what's right and what's wrong. It's not just, well, I love you the way you are and you should stay that way. Right, Whatever the sin is in the world, that they, whatever sin that person has, if you really love them, you'll hold them accountable for it. Because we want them to grow in their relationship with Jesus. If they only come to church once a quarter, okay, you can hold them in love accountable. We need to be together, family. I love the online church. I think it's great. I'm an advocate for it. But I also want people to be here in church. Because we need to grow together in faith. We need to have those conversations. We need to, to be together. So I'm trying to hurry up here, guys, for you. So I'll, I'll read this for you. 1 John 4, 16-18. This is a very important scripture. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. And whoever lo lives in love lives in God. And God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. There is a day of judgment. 
And in this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has nothing to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians can be our prayer as well. We can experience His power, the power of God. We can experience His presence and perceive His love. And this in turn lets us reach out in loving acts to a hurting world around us. Living in darkness and anxiety as people of the, of the congregation. It helps us stop saying, no, we can't, and enable us to say, well, let's be faithful and walk in the way of the Lord. Trust the Lord to guide us as a congregation to do whatever it takes to grow the kingdom of God and His church. And I say His church, the church, right? This is a global enterprise we have as a church. We need Him. It will allow us as the people to love people that need Christ. That need Christ. To truly be hope for the hopeless. So friends, let's live as people who believe in the power of God, the presence of Christ, and the perception of love. Let us be people of prayer, asking the Lord for guidance in our lives throughout the day. Let us as a congregation be of prayer, asking Him how we can be obedient, not telling Him we can't because A, B, C, D, E, F, the list can go on and on and on. Let us be a congregation called by Jesus to have faith the size of a mustard seed so we can move mountains and change this fallen world in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.